Welcome to our next installment of Ask a Pastor, where we as pastors at Cornerstone seek to answer questions that you may have. We are now entering into part two of our three-part video series uh, answering questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. If you haven't watched the first one on marriage, I would encourage you to go back, watch that one before we get here. We said last time that marriage in the scriptures is the, the main uh, topic of these three. It is the ocean in which we swim. The beauty and the permanence, the purpose of marriage uh, goes from Genesis to Revelation. It is big. The questions of divorce and remarriage are smaller streams that, uh, that are addressed but are kept far smaller and we tend to get it backwards. We make the questions of divorce and remarriage the ocean in which we swim. We all want these types of answers as we have questions and struggles and, and heartaches and difficulties, but we want to get the order right and the focus of scripture right. So if you haven't seen the first one, go back and watch the first video on marriage. And today we're going to talk a bit about divorce. And as we said last time, God is very clear. The scriptures are clear. God hates divorce. Sin is always involved when divorce is, is happening. When a man and a wife get divorced, that is a violent act. It says in Malachi that a man clothes himself with violence if he divorces his wife. It is God who knits them together. So we start off right off the bat. Marriage is meant to be permanent. God hates divorce. It is violent. But then, of course, the questions arise, and we want to look at them. We have what is commonly known as the exception clauses in Scripture. There are two of them, and we'll get, we'll get to that. Uh, and this is where all the questions come in, and people really start to wonder, what does this actually mean? If marriage is meant to be permanent and God hates divorce, are there exception clauses? What do they mean? So we say that God hates divorce. That should be the banner that flies over every conversation that we have. Marriage is meant to be permanent. God hates divorce. That is always true. And yet we have these passages in Scripture that speak of times that divorce is allowed. If we are going to humble ourselves before the Word, if it truly is our authority, we cannot get away, and we cannot turn a blind eye to those passages that talk about divorce and the allowance of it. We have to press in, and we have to understand uh, that the Lord has spoken about this and we want to humbly receive what he has. So we have a few examples. We have Moses, of course, in the Old Testament law, where it was written, God allowed divorce. And Jesus said, we mentioned last time, that that was allowed because of the hardness of heart. Hardness of heart, that is sin. Sin is always present when divorce is present. But we also have that phrase, it was allowed. And now we have a very strange conundrum. It's inescapable that God allowed something that he hated. In his good and perfect law that describes the character of God, that highlights who he is, his character and his glory, in that glory, he allowed something that he declared a hatred for. There's something else going on here that is different than just the permanence of marriage. We have a very strange question that um, comes up. And you have a similar example in the book of Ezra, where the men of Israel married foreign wives. And Ezra says, in essence, God hates divorce, but we're going to honor him by having this mass divorce. And he leads the men in this mass divorce. There's obviously something else going on here. How is it possible that God says, I hate that, and yet there are allowances for it. There has to be something else in play if we're going to walk with integrity before the, uh, the text. If there wasn't anything else to consider here, then the very fact that God hates it would end the discussion. We wouldn't have to do this video in any way, shape, or form. God says, I hate this. We say, amen. We don't do it. But the scriptures say, God hates this. And then it says he allows it in certain circumstances because of sinfulness. Okay, now I know this is already causing turmoil in some of you, and it ought to. It is difficult. We can't get away from this challenge that we're facing, even if it's uncomfortable. It's there in the scriptures, and we can't ignore it. So let's press in a little bit. There is something else to consider in the matter of divorce. That's what we want to look at now. Uh, there are other principles of God's glory and his honor at play, and I'm going to tell you, at the outset here, what the principle is, and then we're going to press into the 
topic a little bit more to help us understand what is going on here with these, with these types of scenarios. The principle is this. God will not punish the innocent. God will not punish the innocent. Hold that thought in your mind as we walk through. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? God's name would be profaned if he brought the same judgment on the innocent that he does on the guilty. Can you see that? God's righteousness would be maligned. He would be dishonored if he punished innocent people in the same way he punishes guilty people. There is a principle that can never change. If there is an innocent party, they do not come under the same judgment as the guilty. Listen to Proverbs 17, 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. God hates injustice. He hates it. He does not abide in justice. Proverbs 18, 5. It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. God will not pass the same judgment on the innocent that he does on the righteous. This is part of the character and the glory of God. He will not malign his name by being uh, unjust towards his people. All right, now we keep pressing in. Israel in the Old Testament breaks the covenant with God. Right? They break the covenant, and yet God was not to blame. He was not the one punished for being part of a broken covenant. We read this in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, God himself is a part of a divorce. The word divorce is used. God himself is divorcing Israel, something that he hates. Remember, God hates divorce, and here God himself is a part of a divorce. Listen to Jeremiah 3, verse 8. He's talking about Judah when he says she. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, I, this is the Lord, I sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. God divorced Israel in Jeremiah. He sent her away with a decree of divorce. So here we have divorce is a hated thing but it is not always a sinful thing when there is an innocent party involved. God himself has gone before and showed this to be true in how he has divorced Israel in Jeremiah, sent her away with a decree of divorce, yet he is not guilty of sin. Israel's guilty of sin. God does not punish the innocent in the same way that he does the guilty. Now we start to see a little bit how this principle comes to play. There are two parties in every divorce. There is the husband and the wife. And God judges between the two. So the point is, sin happens at every divorce. There's always sin involved. God hates it. It is violent. It is betraying the very purpose of the permanence of marriage that displays the glory of God, that displays his love and the permanence of his love. There's always sin involved when divorce is happening. God hates that violence. And yet God does not punish the innocent in the same way that is the guilty. This is what introduces this conflict. This is what introduces the whole challenge that we have because we want to protect the sacredness, the holiness of marriage that God has put his spirit in there. We want to protect that and cherish that. We don't want to leave any open doors. And yet the scripture says, God sent Israel away with the decree of divorce. God's not guilty of sin. They were. There are two parties at play and God is just in all things. So we have in scriptures... Exception clauses, if you want to use that phrase, in two cases, adultery and abandonment. Think of it as the two A's, adultery and abandonment. This is going to be the next video, and we're going to press in a little bit to um, some of those things in the passages that talk about that. But it is important to note, as we carry on this conversation, as we see the allowance of divorce in very limited and specific areas, divorce is never commanded in the scriptures. It is never mandatory. In the word of God, hope is never lost. You never have to pursue divorce. God loves marriage. So it's never mandatory. Hope never completely is lost. But there are times that it is allowed. And we're going to look next time at Matthew chapter 19, where the adultery exception clause is noted, and 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where the abandoned 
abandonment was. We're not going to talk about them much in detail. Each situation, each struggling marriage needs to be handled in person with pastoral care and discipleship in the word. A video is never going to answer all of your questions and a video is not sufficient to weigh every specific situation. I do not want to give anybody an open door to go pursue a divorce or a separation because of what they saw over a video. This is deeply personal, it is deeply complicated, and it can last a lifetime. God warns us again and again about the evils of divorce. So I'm not going to talk about individual cases. I'm not going to try to weigh in and judge your individual case. Please do not take anything you see in these videos and run with it to a conclusion. Come and talk to some of the pastors if you have questions or if your marriage is struggling. We can talk about it one-on-one -on -one as it ought to be. Uh, a video will never will never give you all the content that you need. That is insufficient. So we have seen that divorce is allowed in certain cases. It is never mandatory. God hates it. And yet he allows something that he hates. This is the teaching of Scripture. That's going to ruffle some of you and stir the pot a little bit. I would encourage you to look at those verses and spend some time studying that and open your heart to be humbled before the Word. Does it indeed say these things? And you'll find that it does. Divorce can be allowed. There's always sin, but God does protect the innocent party. So in the next video, we want to pick this up and keep pressing into it. We're going to uh, then add on to the this conversation, the conversation of, of remarriage. So we'll talk to you in the next video.